When she woke up on the Friday morning, November 3rd, 2006, 27-year-old Justine Ebshire, who was newly wed, had many dreams ahead of her. She wanted to have children and finish her master's degree. Her husband, Eric Ebshire, already had two children from a previous relationship, and Justine got along very well with them, as she loved children. They met in 1999, when Justine worked as a cashier at a convenience store and Eric was a businessman. She was only 20 and he was 26 and newly divorced. Eric decided to serve the Marines for a while, a childhood dream. And when he returned from his journey, they got married. Eric then started his own business, a Friday forwarding company. Justine also got a new job as a kindergarten teacher at a school in Culpeper, Virginia. On November 3rd, Four months after marriage, Justine left for work as she did every morning, but something was wrong. All her colleagues noticed that something had happened and she seemed to have been crying recently due to her swollen eyes, but she said she was fine, that it was just an allergy. Later that day, Justine went to college where she was doing a master's in education. She was 30 minutes late for class and was wearing sunglasses. When class ended at 7 p.m., the woman left without speaking to anyone. Her colleagues didn't know it, but that would be the last time they would see her alive. Around 2 a.m., a 911 call was made. There was a hit and run and the driver fled. The police arrived a few minutes later and found Eric in the middle of the road. He was hysterical and crying uncontrollably. In his arms, his wife Justine. It appeared that she had suffered multiple traumas and no longer had vital signs. Eric told the police that Justin called him at 1.20 a.m. She said her car had broken down and asked him to pick her up. She was about 8 kilometers from home. Eric got on his motorcycle and drove to where she said she was. But when he got there, he found her lying on the road. Eric told the police that she was still breathing, covered her with his jacket and left desperately for help. He knocked on the door of several houses in the neighborhood begging for help but no one answered, until an elderly lady saw the man running up and down the street and let him make a 911 call. This call was made at exactly 1.57 a.m. Orange Kelly 911, where is your emergency? This man just came out to my um, door and said his wife got hit by a car. Eric told the police that he had his cell phone in his pocket, but he was so nervous that he didn't realize it until later. The scene looked like a hit-and-run affair, but suddenly, the story took a surprising turn. Police didn't find broken glass or brake marks on the road. There were no signs of skidding and no blood was visible. Not on Justine, not on her clothes, or not on the floor, despite the multiple wounds on her body. The officers came to believe, based on the physical evidence, that Justine had not been left standing in the middle of the street and been hit by a car but that someone had caused her death. Investigators also found that, despite Eric's claim that Justine called him to say she was having a car trouble, her car was running perfectly fine, and no mechanical or electrical defects were found. Justine was very close to her parents, Heidi and Steven Swartz, and her sister, Lauren Swartz, and they were devastated when they received a call from Eric's brother saying that Justine was dead. Shock and devastation turned to confusion. They knew Justine very well. She had a panic of the dark and even went to the therapy to address that fear, so it did make sense to them that she had driven alone at night and would be standing in the middle of a deserted street alone. They also didn't understand how her body was found lying in the middle of the road, about a hundred meters away from her car. The purse, coat and keys were inside it. It was incomprehensible that she had gone so far from the car since she had already called Eric. All she had to do was to stay inside the vehicle and wait. It was a dark, moonless night and very cold. Two days after Justine's funeral service, things began to fall into place. Heidi, Justine's mother, walked into a restaurant and had a breakdown. She was overcome with emotion. A woman working at the restaurant asked if she needed anything. Heidi told all about Justine and what had happened to her daughter. The woman told Heidi that her daughter wasn't run over. She was killed by her husband. 
Heidi discovered that several people in the neighborhood were sure that Eric was the culprit, but she couldn't understand why, and still contacted the police, asking that he be investigated. The police spoke with Eric, asking again about the dynamics of that night's events. He said everything was normal. Justine came home after class and he was already there. Before, he had gone to the hospital to visit his mother. They ate, and Eric received a call from the hospital as his mother had gotten worse. He told the police that he went to the hospital again and stayed there until 11.30 p.m. But when he left, he didn't go straight home. Instead, he took a walk around town to clear his head. According to Eric, it was half past midnight when he got home. Justine was awake and said she wanted to talk to him. The two began to argue because according to him, Justine didn't like him going out at night, even if it was to visit his sick mother in the hospital. The man said he didn't want to argue and needed to be alone, and Justine said she needed to be alone too. According to Eric, Justine then left the house. He said he wasn't worried, as he expected his wife to come home soon, so he sat on the couch and watched TV. At dawn, he received a call from her asking to pick her up, as the car would not start. Eric took about 15 minutes to leave the house after Justine called as he got dressed and claimed he found her between 1.39 and 1.44. Eric's version of events didn't convince the police, mainly to the lack of evidence at the scene of the hit and run and the injuries on the woman's body. Investigators decided to delve deeper into the couple's lives and try to understand what really happened. It would take four years but the police finally got enough evidence to officially charge Eric with murder. The prosecution hypothesized that Eric murdered his wife due to financial problems. Several witnesses were heard, and all reported the woman's behavior change after marriage. Definitely, Justine had changed a lot. She no longer went out with friends, wouldn't return phone calls, and even refused the bouquet of flowers her colleague roommate sent her as a wedding present, claiming that Eric didn't like her friend. The police have come to believe that Justine was killed elsewhere and taken to the road where she was found, so that Eric could stage a hit and run and get away. Upon his wife's death, he would receive 1.5 million in life insurance. The prosecution told the court that Justine's injuries were not consistent with her being hit by a vehicle. She suffered 113 blunt forces injuries to her body. She had several broken bones, lacerated organs, and 23 injuries to her head. However, there was a little blood at the scene. Two medical examiners testified on behalf of prosecution. They said that Justine's death was not caused by a hit and run. They believed, due to her injuries, that she was beaten, strangled, and run over after she was already dead. The doctor who conducted Justine's autopsy said he found strong evidence of manual strangulation, in addition to several deep bruises on the neck muscles and hemorrhages in the eye and lip. Doctor said Justine suffered several serious internal injuries, including lacerated and bruised lungs, broken ribs, a broken pelvis, as well as lacerations to her spleen and liver. Some wounds didn't bleed and this indicated that they were caused after Justine was already dead. In her body was found less than half of the blood that she would have accumulated in her chest and abdominal cavities. A second doctor said the average female body contains 5 liters of blood, but less than a liter was found in Justine's. This was not compatible with the lack of blood on the road. Therefore, the woman was definitely killed somewhere else. Eric's ex-wife, Alison Crawford, with whom he had two children, testified against him. She said that less than two hours before Eric called 911, he texted her asking if she still thought about him and if she could ever get back together. According to forensics, Eric made 43 calls and sent multiple text messages to Alice on the day Justine died. The man told his ex-wife that he made a mistake and regretted marrying Justine. Another witness, a bus driver named Cecil Roebuck, said he was driving along the road that night and was unfamiliar with the route, so he stopped the car and began to maneuver as he entered a dead end and was almost out of gas. At this time, Sassu saw a man and asked for help to take him to a gas station. This man agreed. But before they reached the station, he stopped the car and told Sassu that he was running out of gas and needed to go home. 
so he asked Sassu to get out and ask for a ride back. At first, Sassu didn't connect the incident with Justine's case, until he saw about the woman's death on a TV show two years later. He stated that the man who picked him up was Eric and he was driving the wife's car. Justine's father, Steve Swartz, also testified. He told the court that his daughter at the time of her death owed $85,000 in the couple's name. Insurance representatives also testified under the policy that Eric was the beneficiary. According to them, two weeks after Justine's death, the man had already filed the application. He claimed $1.5 million for a traffic accident, but since Justine died in a hit and run outside her car, the insurance company only paid $100,000. Eric then hired a team of lawyers and asked for a review, requesting an additional $300,000, which was granted. He used all the money to pay off personal and company debts. Some people claim that Eric began having a relationship with a woman, whose name has not been revealed, just three days after Justine's death. An expertise carried out on the man's cell phone proved that he was at home during the entire period in which he claimed to have gone to the hospital that night, which would have given him enough time to put this macabre plan in action, and possibly it was he himself who made the call to his cell phone using his wife's phone. The call only lasted 15 seconds. The prosecution also told the jury that Eric used his phone 157 times that day, so the fact he said he didn't realize the phone was in his pocket until some time after he found Justine's body was a lie. Also highlighted was the fact that Eric was in the Marines, where he received training in CPR and first aid, but he made no effort to help Justine. Lastly, the prosecution revealed that he had a nickname for Justine, found in some notes and cell phone messages. He called her That Thing. The men's defense continued to claim he didn't run, and Eric's brother said they were a happy couple. Finally, defense lawyers said that the testimony of Sessio, the bus driver, was false and that the man only did it to get the reward of $50,000 that the family promised for information about the crime, but to no avail. The jury found Eric guilty of first-degree murder and he was sentenced to life in prison. At Eric's sentencing hearing, the court heard statements from the victim's friends and family. In the months leading up to the woman's death, Justine's family and friends noticed a change in her personality. She felt useless and tried to do everything to please Eric, and that he had a violent past. During the four years the police investigated the case, Justine's family fought hard to ensure that Eric was locked up until his trial. The woman's father, Steven Swartz, said, Aside from wanting Justine's case to be resolved, the other thing we hope is that no one else gets hurt. Justine had her life taken by someone she loved, someone who was supposed to protect her, but who treated her with contempt and humiliation. She is the reflection of many women who let themselves be carried away by the love they feel, but those who love don't offend, don't hurt, and of course, don't kill. Well guys, that was it for today. Thanks for watching until the end, best wishes, and I see you next time.